Hey, let's welcome in our first guest. He is the treasurer of the state of West Virginia and a candidate for Congress, too, Riley Moore. Rye, good morning to you, buddy. Good morning. How are y'all doing? I am doing well, thank you. What are you up to, man? I hear a lot going on in that background there. Yeah, well, I'm uh, heading up to Wheeling, actually, here today. So i uh, got a couple events up there. I'm uh, going to be doing something with uh, Northern Community College. I'm uh, going to be jumping in with the welding class there and talking about the Jumpstart Savings Program. And then I'm um, on a board uh, panel discussion up there about workforce development up in Weirton uh, later today. So uh, action-packed day. Do the Northern Panhandle citizens uh, identify with the Eastern Panhandle citizens, Riley, in some ways? I think they do in some ways is that, you know, they're both kind of tri-state areas, obviously, and both feel like they're uh, widely ignored uh, by Charleston, which they're not wrong about that. Unless you're talking about my office, that's something that we've certainly worked a lot on. That's why I'm going up there and uh, trying to make sure that they're getting the same, uh, same type of love that the rest of the state does. Everybody needs some love, man. Hey, yeah, exactly. let's talk about some uh, some poll results that have come up in the, a primary poll that was released on, I guess, April the 16th. Um, was that uh, two days ago? And they polled a couple different races, one of which was yours for these uh, statewide federal races for Congress. Uh, Riley Moore at 88.8 percent, Nate Kane at 6.8 percent, and Alexander Gasserud at 4.4 percent. I don't want to say that you have a comfortable lead, Riley, but uh, 82% is, some would say, pretty comfortable. Well, don't short me. It was 88. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, no, I'm doing my math uh, here. You you have 88.8, Nate oh, Kane's yeah, next yeah, at oh, 6.8. Yeah, yeah. That's 82. Yeah, I think he's, he's commenting because the second time you said 82, you oh, knocked oh, I did? Yeah. The polls went down. Oh, I knocked his poll numbers down? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're at 88.8%. Yeah. The spread is 82%. Sorry. No, you know, obviously, um, you love to see that. It's very early, so I take nothing for granted. Uh, but I think, obviously, it's a testament to me a couple things. One is the hard work that I've put in as a delegate for the Eastern Panhandle and now in the last several years statewide elected as state treasurer and all the things that we have done to push back on the SG. Uh, the Jumpstart Savings Program, the fights we've got into BlackRock and J.P. Morgan Chase and everything else, protecting our fossil fuel industries here in the state of West Virginia. There's been a tremendous amount that I've been able to do in this office. So I think the difference here is I'm very clearly a proven conservative. And I think that's what folks are looking for. They're looking for a proven track record out there that they know how an individual is going to conduct themselves in the office that they're seeking. I think that's abundantly clear, obviously, given my track record. Certainly in the legislature, I had one of the most conservative voting records in the legislature uh, when, during my time there. And I was, I'm over 90 percent, by the way, uh, in terms of my conservative rating. Mm-hmm. And then the things that I've been able to do as state treasurer. And, um, you know, we started a national movement really, right here in West Virginia on the pushback against the environmental social governance movement, ESG, in this country. I was the first elected official in America to divest from BlackRock, and now we've had nine, soon to be ten, um, other states divest from BlackRock, but that started all right here. This was a poll that was done by WVStatewide.com, and it was 1,148 statewide responses. The accuracy of the poll is estimated to be 95%, with a margin uh, plus minus 5%. They're going to poll again uh, quarterly as the election draws near. Jonathan. So if you had one of Riley's opponents and, and 81%, you lost. As Warner Wolf would yes, say, you lost. You lost. <laughs> Riley, um, we appreciate everything you've done, especially pushing back, because our coal industry, our fossil fuel industries are so important. What are some other things that you've identified that you want to push for 
um, if and when you get into Congress, some other other opportunities, some other conservative points that you think really aren't being pushed hard enough? Well, you know, this is something I've been consistently talking about, and that's education of freedom and choice. Obviously, I've run the Hope Scholarship Program in West Virginia. Um, was honored to be able to work on that in the legislature with Senator Patricia Rucker and the rest of the leadership, like uh, Senator Craig Blair. And, you know, this is something for me that we have to take to the federal level. We must eliminate the Department of Education and stop. It's got to go. Look, we were in first place in the world as it relates to educational attainment and outcomes before the Department of Education. If you take it in totality, we're ranked 17th. If you take it math and science, we're ranked doggone near the, I mean, middle of the pack, like in the 50th uh, uh, slot right there. That is unacceptable. So to me, I think the elimination of the Department of Education, move money to back to the state, and then secondarily, I think you can take money and move it over to the Department of Treasury, just like we do here in West Virginia, and create national educational savings accounts like Hope Scholarship for students all over this country so we can get ourselves back on track and really focus on the kids and focus on their attainment and their outcome and so they can fulfill their dreams. So I think that's a really big issue that I'm going to continue to push on and something that I want to see happen uh, if I'm elected to Congress. And they did vote on it here just recently, and it did pass the House. Um, They did not mention this piece, as I'm talking about, in terms of ESAs. I think that's got to be part of it. And so this is certainly something I'm going to continue to push on. Well, I think it it just makes sense that the the kids should be put first. So much of the time our our educational system is is very top-heavy and having a lot of federal oversight on it, which – I mean, the, the, the Constitution did not intend, obviously, as we all know, for the federal government to, to have their hand in as many things that should be state issues. What are, what, are some yeah. other, what are some other things that you've looked at that you've identified that you've seen maybe not get through that, that you want to see go through? Yeah, I mean, obviously for me, uh, it, and this did come up, but I think we need to post Dobbs. Attack, uh, tackle the abortion issue on a federal level. I think we need to have some type of wherever that is, you know, we're talking about saving lives here, but something that creates some minimal standard uh, in terms of where it is acceptable nationwide. Now, obviously, I want no weeks, but look, if, if somehow the best thing we can come up with and, and get across the line would be 15 weeks, Sure, I'll take that, but something has to be done on the federal level to start saving lives across this country. It's Dobbs not only allowed the states to weigh in on this, but it also allows Congress to weigh on this on the abortion debate. Secondarily, China obviously is something everybody has been talking about, but we need to also be talking about it in terms of literally a declaration of economic independence. So a declaration of economic independence from China. We must declare our independence here. And we see the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy decoupling at a rapid rate. China is moving in a direction where by the next several years, they're going to have nearly 70 percent of all the end items that they manufacture, those parts and components, are going to be made in China. They're not buying them from us anymore, right? So it's all original content. How are we going to bring those jobs, reshore them back here in America, in the United States? I think some of that can be done through technological revolutions and AI, or perhaps maybe it took a 1,000 jobs to create a widget over in China. Maybe through those innovations, we can do that here in the United States, I believe, with maybe 500 jobs or 250 jobs. It's all a net gain at the end of the day, but something that's also going to pay a livable wage so we're not having our people making the same type of um, income that they're making in China, which is obviously abhorrent. But we have to decouple ourselves. It's a national security issue, and it's certainly an American manufacturing issue and trying to grow the middle class 
and make it strong again. We can't just have a country where either everyone's a lawyer or a doctor or they're working at Walmart, so to speak, right? I mean, that's not what this is about. So we have to reclaim that back from the globalists and the elites that have really destroyed the middle class of this country. Globalization has been a big part of that. So that's certainly something I'm going to push on if I am elected. Well, I mean, with a with a big rival like China and with all the issues with China and Taiwan and everything going on, I mean, to have so many things that we desperately need only manufactured in China is scary. I mean, it's, it's not good for our national security. I agree 100 percent with you. Let me roll back to West Virginia for a minute. I mean, we've talked about the, the BlackRock, the Hope Scholarship, all the great things that you've been a part of accomplishing to help our state. Looking forward over the next year, what are some things that you want the state treasurer's office to accomplish to make things better for West Virginians? Well, one of the things that we, the bill that we passed, actually not last session, but the previous session, is called, and sorry, it's a little boring, but it's called pulled collateral. And this is an important bill, actually. So in West Virginia, for uh, banks here to take public deposits, they have to be collateralized at over 100%. I mean, so why are they going to take those? So they're going to be sitting on treasury notes and these other things. And that's kind of tying their hands. Now, other states like Virginia and Ohio and other places, they have pulled collateral. So the exposure to those banks, and we're talking about community banks, right? Bank of Charlestown, Jefferson Securities, our local banks, giving them the ability to take those deposits and not just the big boys just gobbling all them up. So what I am focused on here is trying to strengthen our community banking sector in West Virginia moving through the next year. So we are going to be rolling out those rules around that bill and also going to be looking at other pieces of legislation potentially to further strengthen our community banks here in West Virginia. Because the last thing I want to see, particularly post-Silicon Valley Bank, is massive consolidation. Community banks are the backbone of any great state like West Virginia, right? All states have community banks, and they're really kind of the linchpin of the small business community, right? I mean, people like that personal touch and that feel. They understand what's going on in their community. J.P. Morgan Chase, which is a behemoth, is not going to understand, you know, the intricacies of – what is going on in the eastern panhandle, needless to say, the the, uh, the entire state of West Virginia. So certainly going to be focusing on that. Well, with companies like that, you are just a number, if that. I mean, it's your community banks that are sponsoring little league teams, that are sponsoring, you know, the local United Way that – where a small business owner can go to them and you can, you know, shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye and and ask for ask for that loan to, to build your business, to move things forward. And they take a look at other things besides the, you know, they, they understand the local business climate more than just, you know, numbers on a page like you get when you look at a big bank uh, like like J.P. Morgan Chase or any yeah, of the that's exactly any of the big right. ones. Yeah, and look, my father worked at Bank of Charlestown and um, loved working there. And, I mean, I, you know, I, we got great community banks here in West Virginia. And, you know, it, it's certainly something that I want to ensure that uh, we're making it as friendly for them to operate. And I get worried, you know, the feds, and this is certainly something on the congressional side, they always answer whenever there's like some crisis, quote unquote, uh, as it relates to the banking sector. What do they want? More regulation. More regulation is going to fix the problem. It's like, well, no, Silicon Valley Bank was actually doing bad business, right? So now not everybody else should be punished for that. And when we saw regulation back in Dodd Frank, when that happened after the housing bubble burst and we had that economic meltdown that massive regulations that came in i mean the banks still have to deal with obviously and it's a lot of compliance which costs a lot of money now if you're jp morgan chase you don't care you got a whole building full of lawyers that are just going to deal with that if you're bank of charlestown that's a little bit different and so we saw a lot of consolidation in the banking sector and to me i think that's scary look we got over over half over 50% of 
of all of our deposits in America are sitting in the top five biggest banks. That's scary to me. That's scary. That's I mean, scary I think, to me also. I, yeah. Yeah. And that's certainly something that I, I, we're creating situations with regulations and consolidation where you end up too big to fail. It's like, well, but this bank can't go down, so we're going to come in and save it. I mean, that's not the way this is supposed to be. Treasurer Riley Moore, our guest here on the program, a recent poll conducted by WVStatewide.com for Congress has him with 88.8% uh, right now. His other two contenders, if you can call them that at this point, obviously trailing uh, by a significant amount. Uh, Riley, if you're in Congress, uh, in theory, the way it used to work is if America went to war, the president would sign the Declaration of War uh, over to Congress. Uh, they would uh, vote on it. And then we go to war. We haven't done that in quite some time. It's uh, kind of bypassed that process. But let's just say we go back to playing by the rules. And this situation with uh, Ukraine continues. Uh, you've got China watching to see what happens because they've got their eyes on Taiwan. And they are very much uh, talking with Putin about this whole strategy because it looks like they would like to move on Taiwan at some point. You're in Congress. This thing continues to escalate. The president, whoever it is at that time, asks for a declaration of war. You're now in that seat where you've got to vote. Declaration against war against which one? Well, it could be either. Who knows? It could be both at some point along the way, depending on how this thing escalates in the years to come. But it's a lot to weigh. I'm not asking you how you'd vote at this point, enough, but I would like to know your foreign policy thoughts on this. I know you've done a lot of think tank stuff with this in the past in Washington, D.C., and we've got two pretty big issues looming out there in the near future, what with the Ukraine situation and potentially Taiwan? Yeah, I, I think as a, what you're seeing right now in Ukraine, right, obviously, is it's, it's accelerated this potential and now growing relationship between China and Russia, which is putting us in a massively disadvantaged position. And it does roll back into what I was talking about in terms of manufacturing and coming back home. Look, World War II, when we ramped up and mobilized industry here in the United States to create uh, the biggest war economy that the world had ever seen, to be able to manufacture the planes and tanks and all those things, we did that because we had the capacity to do it. We don't have that capacity right now. We're, we're settled into just this tech economy. So I guess if China invades, we could like post a Facebook comment about it, be like, this is terrible. Um, you know, <laughs> that's not the position that we mm -hmm. want to be in. So I, I think what this is going to continue to bump along is I think we're going to end up, and we already are, in somewhat of a Cold War type situation with China. And I think there are going to be these proxy conflicts that are going to bubble up. What we have to do, though, is be measured in how we think about this, because if we get dragged into certain proxy conflicts that diminish our capacity to be able to surge, if there were a big conventional conflict threatening the United States, that our hands aren't tied. And so, as the military says, it all comes down to readiness, right? And I think right now our readiness, and you know, the armed forces talk about this all the time, I mean, it's talking about the Marine Corps, maybe readiness is like 50 percent, maybe less than that. that. That's not acceptable. Right. So we have to be prepared. And, you know, like the old adage goes, if you want peace, prepare for war. And I think it's not only militarily, but economically that we have to be able to do that to keep our country safe. Right. Peace through strength, so to speak, as Reagan said. So. We have to be in a stronger position to be able to protect the United States and our interests and equities here at home. And, look, as it relates to Ukraine, what I'd like to see happen, which is not, is have somebody, Biden or, you know, President Biden or somebody else, articulate what is our strategic goal in Ukraine. Is it... We're here to support the Ukrainians in their struggle against the Russians, or is it the strategic defeat of the Russian military and the collapse of that country? So if it's the latter, 
who's going to come in and do the peacekeeping operations and stability operations in a country like Russia that has parity with the United States in terms of the strategic nuclear weapons that they have? I mean, it's a scary thing to think about, and you've not really heard people discussing it. And so I would hope that somebody out there is thinking about that. Treasurer Riley Moore, our guest candidate for Congress as well. Let's go back to your treasurer job. Every once in a while I get a press release about some money that's being distributed to somebody around West Virginia, Riley, money that they didn't know they had coming to them. Uh, where is that money found? Whose job is it to find uh, the money that's uh, due somebody they didn't know was due to them? Well, every state has what's called unclaimed property. And there's laws on the books in every state that let's say you have a dormant bank account or securities that have not been acted on in years and years and years and years, that uh, those dormant accounts or property that's just found will then come over, like a safety deposit box or something like that, will then come over to the treasurer's office from a bank, uh, from an asset manager, so on and so forth. And so then it's our job to then go either – find the next of kin or that individual in the state of West Virginia. And we've done a lot to modernize that. We now have the database online where you can search your name online. By the way, that's at wvtreasury.com. Just click on uh, unclaimed property there. And we've been breaking records back to back to back um, uh, year in and year out on the amount of money that we've been able to return. And part of that was when I came into office, there was a law literally mandating that I have to advertise a certain um, amount in terms of dollars spent just on newspaper advertising. Well, look, it's 2023, and at the time, 2021, there's a lot better ways that we can advertise this stuff, and we can become a lot more effective if we're able to diversify the manner in which we're advertising and doing outreach. And so I changed that law, which got, you know, the West Virginia Press Association and some others very upset, but it has proven out. It has worked. Now, in rural areas where perhaps they don't have great Internet connectivity, Pocahontas County comes to mind as one of those, we will do newspaper advertising. But in places like perhaps like Jefferson and Berkeley, it does make more sense to do this advertising online and find other ways to reach out to people. And it's really proven out. And I think that's why we've been able to um, increase the amount of unclaimed property claims. Because at the end of the day, this is the people's money, and it's my job and my duty to get it back to them. And I've been proud to be able to increase that uh, every year since I've been in office. Yeah, I uh, we had the home show here in Martinsburg a few weeks ago, and you guys had a uh, you guys had a table out there. And I went up and found that I had about 80 bucks worth of unclaimed nice. money. It was uh, hey, pennies go. from heaven. I had a nice, your people were great. They were really helpful. They were helping one person after another go through and go into the database, and they were showing us how to claim it. It was, it was really a great and easy process, Riley. I, w I wish I'd had more than $80, but, you know, $80 is $80. <laughs> I wish I'd have known you had the $80. You could have bought lunch that day. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Riley, well, thanks so much for your... Oh, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. Makes me ha just makes me happy to hear that. And uh, seriously, if, if you think, just you never know. WBTreasury.com, click on unclaimed property. You never know what they might find. And to your name, you never know, right? Hey, Riley, That's thank right. you. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you all so much. Have a great day. You Thanks, too. Riley. You too. Treasurer Riley Moore, candidate for Congress as well, and right now polling at 88.8%, and uh, three people included in that poll. He obviously has a very comfortable lead there.